Hello, and welcome to the SHFQA Quantum Analyzer virtual launch event. Today, you will see Zurich Instruments SHFQA in action. With its integrated frequency up and down conversion, the ability to read out up to 16 qubits per channel and up to four readout channels per instrument, the SHFQA is a game changer for quantum computing. To ensure the safety of everyone involved in light of the current COVID-19 situation, we recently had to review the format of this online event. Consequently, the presentations and demonstrations have been pre-recorded, but the final Q&A session will be live. You will have the opportunity to ask questions during the entire event. Please write your questions in the Q&A box, and if they can be answered in a few sentences, they will be addressed directly in the same Q&A box by our experts during the presentations. Other questions will be answered by our presenters during the live Q&A session. Let me now introduce our CEO, Sadik, who will give you an overview of Zurich Instruments, our mission in quantum computing, the tools we provide to help build the quantum computer, and the projects we are currently working on. Over to you, Sadik. Thank you, Paolo. It is now my pleasure to give you a bit of an overview of the company, show you who we are, how we work, what our mission in quantum computing is. I co-founded the company with two other guys in 2008. At that time, we were doing the lock-in amplifiers. We brought a big step of innovation into the market, which permitted us to grow. Today, we're 100 people. We have houses in America, China, South Korea, France, and Italy, and partners in other parts of the world. This internationalization has a purpose. The goal is to provide all our customers, no matter where they are on the globe, with the best possible support. And the context of quantum computing, this usually means PhD level physicists. In 2014, we realized that uh, when, when the lock-in amplifiers brought us in touch with uh, quantum computing, we realized that there's a big overlap of what we do at Zurich Instruments, what our know-how is, and what the quantum scientists need. And at that time, the lock-in business was uh, sailing smoothly, and we were ready to extend, to, to grow our mission. Today, our mission includes to help build the quantum computer and to become the leading provider for quantum computing control systems worldwide. Since 2014, we have uh, reached a number of milestones. Here's a little summary of some nice installations. Uh, one is in the Quantum Device Lab at ETH Zurich, where we have made uh, some really nice work. A great team over there. Uh, Quantum Inspire. You can go to quantuminspire.com and start our instruments through the web, which is something I really fancy. Quantum in Berkeley, uh, we have the Advanced Quantum Test Bed, where we have a wonderful, a really nice setup. Uh, IQM Finland is a particularly nice case because there we have a startup company that integrates our control system into their commercial product for resale. And it's really nice to see, to be able to help the IQM guys uh, get the mission done. There's a number more installation. Intel, by the way, also really nice. Spin qubits and superconducting qubits. Uh, very nice success story here. Number of more installations, many of them, unfortunately, some of them, unfortunately, not uh, able to mention here. Uh, the track record in terms of publications is something I like a lot. This is, in the end, what really drives and motivates us when we see that our uh, work is actually put into service by people to make, to produce great results. <clears throat> So what we do at Zurich Instruments, from the outside, you may think we're a hardware company, and we are. We design and uh, build hardware at the level that is required, low noise, low drift. However, when you come and look inside, you will notice there's a lot of software going on. And you will also notice that a lot of the value that we provide actually comes from the software, pulse level programming, support for third-party frameworks, that's a result of that. Um, also, we update our software. So the hardware, the instruments, the products you buy from us will actually grow and gain value over time. Taking this together, we can produce a, we, we now have the quantum computing control system where you have a number of products that are 
glued together by software so that you can operate them as if it was one entity. <clears throat> and again, here you have the system as with software typical, it will grow and enhance over time with updates. And by opening the system to third party software providers, uh, we can just include and add rich, rich feature sets that may be very application specific to the system. That's also part of the recipe here. At Zurich Instruments, we like to think about quantum computing as going on in two thrusts. There's the technology thrusts where people are working on better qubits, better gates, better fidelities, longer coherence time. And then there's the scaling thrust where the primary concern is to, bake, to, to build bigger systems, more qubits. And at Zurich Instruments, we want to support both of those trusts. And in addition, we want to support them in the way that the people working on the technology thrust can use the same tools, the same powerful tools as the folks in the scaling thrust. And this then again permits them to go back and forth. It permits the same people to work on both thrusts. What does that mean concretely? How is that panned out at Zurich Instruments? So when we started out in 2014, we had a bunch of instruments. You could combine them and control and, and build a control system for a quantum computer. However, you needed to configure work on each instrument individually. Today, we have the first generation of our quantum computing control system complete. Uh, the difference here is that you can operate the entire system as if it was one entity. Pulse level programming is uh, one of these features here. Also, what we've added on the hardware level is the capability to do quantum error correction. That requires to take readout information, process them centrally, and redistribute the uh, results in a very rapid manner. That's part of the architecture. This generation, this entire system is now complete. It has uh, produced results. It's working really nice. Today, what we're doing is we're working on generation two, a refinement of the first generation. And with that refinement includes hardware and software. Uh, with the SHFQA, which we launched today, we uh, bring out the first member of that new generation. What we address here is to make the system it's more stable. We get rid of all IQ mixers. We reduce latencies further. We accelerate execution times and we take the scalability to beyond 100 qubits. In even more detail, what will be, what is the focus in generation two? Of course, the primary goal is to accelerate progress on uh, NIST systems. And we do this by ensuring First and foremost, that the control system doesn't become the bottleneck. Getting rid of IQ mixtures is part of that idea. They drift, they're nonlinear, they don't help the signal quality, they don't help making good signal bands. At the same time, while making everything more scalable and higher and, and, and increasing the abstract level of abstraction, it's really important that we still permit for tweaking on a sample by sample basis to squeeze out the last bit of information from quantum hardware. Low latency readout is part of that. We want to reduce the time spent on classical control systems further. Still, we think too much time is spent on the classical aspects of quantum computing. And part of that endeavor is to further enhance our Python API, make Python the cockpit of the quantum computing control system. And again, we need, we, by opening our doors and APIs to as many as third party frameworks as possible, we include sometimes very application specific feature sets into the system. We want to enable theoretical physicists to also work on quantum computers in experimental labs. This will help reduce the cycle time increase this, the cycling speed, reduce the feedback for learning cycles, put theoretical physicists right into the position so that they can try out their ideas. And that means pulse level and gate level programming. It has to become the norm. 
We want to extend the cap uh, our system to go beyond, beyond 100 qubits. There's a couple things we need to do for that. One, for example, is to speed up system configuration times uh, so that we can in increase the duty cycle of the setup, increase channel density, for and, and reduce the system complexity. For example, RF generators really are not necessary to have them separate. They can be taken away. And while it might not be the top focus everywhere today, we believe a quantum computing control system already today has to have the capability to do quantum error correction. And here we have a hardware architecture that supports that. We have a, the possibility to close the loop by using lookup tables, somewhat limited, but very easy to use. And we also have the possibility to open an FPGA for the customer to program it directly to have the utmost power available for doing syndrome decode, decoding in a, in, a, in a fast manner. And uh, with this, I conclude my part. Uh, everybody at Zurich Instruments is really excited to be part of this uh, dynamic period in quantum computing. And uh, we hope to help your undertaking uh, as efficiently as possible. And I wish you a nice further uh, presentation on the SHF QA. Thank you, Sadik. We'll see you again in the Q&A session. Let's now move on to the main topic of this event, the SHF QA Quantum Analyzer. This instrument is designed to excel at a task crucial for quantum computing the parallel single shot readout of up to 16 frequency multiplex superconducting qubits, 8 qtrits or 5 qquads on each channel. To understand how this is done, let's take a look at how we read out superconducting qubits. Each qubit is coupled to a detuned readout resonator whose frequency changes depending on the corresponding qubit state. If we now measure the transmission of a probe signal through the resonator, shown in light blue here, this will be low if the qubit is in the ground state and high if the qubit is in the excited state. From this outcome, we can infer the state of the qubit. To save space in the cryostat, it is common practice to use frequency multiplexing on the readout resonators. Each resonator has a slightly different resonance frequency, which means that several resonators can be probed in parallel on the same physical line, and in turn, multiple qubits can be read out at the same time. In this scenario, the main challenge is to maximize the signal-to-noise ratio on the various probe signals. But what does a readout system need to do to read uh, the state of a qubit? It has to generate readout tones for all qubits on the line, at different frequencies and with the appropriate waveform shapes. It has to convert these tones reliably to the correct microwave frequency window and amplify them. The final signal enters the cryostat and the quantum chip. Here, different tones are let through or attenuated, depending on the corresponding qubit state. Once this small signal comes back out of the cryostat, the readout system takes over again. It amplifies the signal, converts it from the microwave region back to the lower frequencies, digitizes it, and finally analyzes it to distill the state of the qubits into single numbers. Each channel of the SHFQA can perform all the tasks taking place before and after the cryostat. All you need are two microwave cables to connect to the cryostat to start reading out your quantum chip. The SHFQA simplifies the frequency up and down conversion by removing the common need for mixer calibration. It also generates and analyzes the readout signal, providing all tools to maximize your signal to noise ratio with minimal latency. Additional features such as the multi-state discrimination, afford even more flexibility to implement complex algorithms, for example, q reset. But it's now time to see some of these capabilities in action. Tobias, the floor is yours. Show us what the SHFQA can do. Thank you, Paolo, and also welcome from my side. Let's dive directly into the main part of this event, which is set up around three demonstrations that show key innovations of the SHFQA. First, we discuss details of the integrated up and down conversion and show you how we do resonator spectroscopy with only two microwave cables. Then, we discuss single shot readout of qubits and qubits 
and demonstrate a simulated parallel readout of 16 qubits. Finally, we will show you how the SHFQA integrates into our bigger quantum computing control system, an example of which you can see here on the right of the slide. We will perform a feedback experiment before we then conclude and answer your questions. So let's start with part one, arguably one of the biggest innovations of this instrument, the integrated frequency conversion. First, let's get back to our setup diagram that Paolo already introduced. Again, everything in the light blue part is integrated into the SHFQA, which then directly interfaces to the cryostat. We now have a look at the part highlighted in orange, which takes a baseband signal below 500 megahertz and converts it to microwave frequency, for example, eight gigahertz, and then down converts the modified signal again back to baseband frequencies. There are three alternatives to achieve this task. Direct RF, where higher Nyquist zones are used to reach the gigahertz frequencies without analog mixers. There's IQ mixing, which is the simplest and as of now the standard approach. Here, a single IQ mixer is used to upconvert the probe signal. And finally, there are double superheterodyne approaches that have a much more complicated analog setup to achieve this conversion. And we at Zurich Instruments have not avoided costs and efforts to implement this last approach. But there's a reason to this. So why did we go through this effort? First of all, as you can see here in the sketch of the analog down conversion part only, there's a microwave signal coming in at the left, and then using two mixers, several amplifiers and filters, this signal is down converted and finally digitized on the right. That's clearly a pretty involved analog conversion scheme. So to answer the question why we went uh, through the hassle of, of designing this, first, let's not jump into the technical details yet, but let's first compare the performance of our approach with the other two approaches. Hopefully we can convince you that this is really the best approach. First, we start with a comparison with respect to the standard scheme currently used, IQ mixing. Let me ask you a question. So what's the most annoying thing when running your experiments, right? When you need to stop your greatly working experiments to recalibrate your mixers and to ensure optimal performance. Our approach completely does away with mixer calibration while maintaining a much better spectral performance. Here, you see a spectrum of an already well-optimized and calibrated PC board that performs IQ up conversion of a single tone at six gigahertz. Besides the signal that we want, we see other harmonics and sidebands of the upconversion process, as well as the leakage of the local oscillator. There's not much you can do about the second and the third order, but the LO leakage in the negative first order can be suppressed through calibration to obtain a much cleaner spectrum. Why do we want that? Well, the more spurious tones we have, the more intermodulation between all the signals are there, and this will ultimately reduce the signal to noise of our measurement or impose serious engineering challenges to avoid all these tones, especially if you consider sending multiple tones in that might even change in frequency during the duration of your experiment. Now, the calibration doesn't stay forever. Even small temperature changes in the lab can change the suppression of other sidebands as shown here in a recently published article. One can see that over the course of two hours, the ratio between the first order sidebands changes dramatically. So how does our approach compare to this in performance? First of all, our approach indicated here in the blue data provides a much cleaner spectrum right from the beginning and this without any calibration needed. In addition, we do not observe a drift over the performance over time. To exemplify how stable our approach really is, we just for fun turned up the temperature of the surrounding by 10 degrees Celsius by looking at the SFDR, which is the ratio from the signal to the highest tone nearby, we see that after a while, the IQ mixing approach just goes completely haywire as the LO and the negative side the band get decalibrated, which is indicated here by the light orange traces. Our approach, again in blue, however, remains completely unfaced by this drastic temperature change. So from the first turn on, we can now really uh, guarantee that we retain a clean and stable spectrum throughout the measurement. So no mixer calibration together with a wideband spurious free approach clearly shows the benefits of the double superheterodyne approach with respect to IQ mixing. 
So what's the situation now with DirectRF? Here, the situation is a bit more nuanced. When choosing DirectRF, one can choose from a myriad of different ADCs and DECs with different performance and suitability to generate signals in the microwave regime using higher Nyquist zones. However, there are current technical limitations that always make you choose between getting either a good bandwidth, high digital resolution, low added latency, uh, which is a, a key ingredient that is needed for, for feedback and quantum error correction, or of course, reasonable cost. In summary, current, techno current technology is just not at the stage where this is a viable and economic path forward. This is what we are convinced of. So now let's go a bit more into the technical details. And first, let me tell you a bit more about how we down convert a microwave signal. This is just to give you a glimpse of what, we, what thought went into our design and to increase your trust in our approach. First, consider we have a signal between one to eight gigahertz with a bandwidth of one gigahertz. In the first step, we choose our variable local oscillator such that any of the input frequencies will be converted to 12 gigahertz. Why do we do this? Well, this allows us to design a special and steep filter that filters out any other frequencies and unwanted harmonics of the up conversion process or the down conversion process in this case, such that we faithfully map the whole range of the input signal to a static 12 gigahertz with a one gigahertz bandwidth. Next, we down convert the signal at 12 gigahertz to three gigahertz using a second mixer with a local oscillator frequency at nine gigahertz. This puts the signal well into the range of our ADC to digitize it. A digital down conversion then makes sure we obtain the full information with the user-friendly handling and full IQ information in the digital domain. But there's more reason why we choose the three gigahertz for the green band. First, note that in total, none of the bands overlapped, except for the green and the blue band. This makes sure on the one hand that the crosstalk is strongly depressed in the detection, but also the overlap of the green and the blue input band has the advantage that it avoids critical zones for the two major applications that we foresee for this instrument. These are spin qubits that operate below two gigahertz or superconducting qubits that typically operate between four and eight gigahertz. And of course, again, the digital down conversion is ideal and still provides us with the full information about the signal. In this analog chain, there are now many adjustable parameters, gains, filter settings, attenuator settings. One advantage, of course, is that everything is software controlled if needed. But this is something you generally do not want to do. Indeed, we took quite a lot of care and made sure that we take this job away from you. So now, if a user comes, he only needs to set up the center frequency of the signal band and the power range. And what we do is we choose the optimal settings for you. In this case, you will always get the best and linear uh, signal. So let's put this up conversion to the test. So in this first demo, what we will do now is we will measure the transmission of a resonator, which has a resonance frequency of about 8.1 gigahertz. This is a standard 3D cavity that you also find in quantum computing or superconducting qubit experiments. For this, we will send a single frequency tone out of the instrument and measure its change in amplitude and phase at the input of the instrument. With the search FQA, we really only need two microwave cables to do this experiment. Of course, in a real experiment, you would have at least a cryostat around the cavity. Still, you only need two microwave cables to set your readout up. So now let's start with the demo. But before we go into the actual measurement of the readout resonator, let me quickly remind you how we interface with our instruments. On the screen, you can see our lab one graphical user interface, where on the left, we can select the different functionalities of the SHFQA. For example, using the setup tab, we can configure our qubit readout, or we can observe the input data with our built-in oscilloscope. The tab, which is open here, is the input and output tab. There we can configure the super line frequency conversion parameters. As mentioned before, the only parameters that need to be set are the center frequency and the powers of the in and the output. And of course, if you want to enable them. However, there are many different settings behind that that are being changed. The most important of which you can see in this graphical representation. 
For example, looking at the output filter here, if I change the center frequency to 8 gigahertz, this will also adjust this filter setting. Of course, it also changes the local oscillator frequency here accordingly. Another common way to interface with the instruments is through our APIs, which is the approach that we choose for the remaining demos in this event. This is also the preferred way to integrate instrument control into your own control software. The API runs concurrent with the graphical user interface and gives you complete access to all settings and configurations of the instrument. This is convenient as it allows you to observe directly whether the changes you make in the API, in this case Python, are correct. For example, if I connect to the same instrument through our API that I already connected through the user interface, I can now change the center frequency back to 3 GHz, and I see that this is immediately synchronized with Lab 1. What you see also in this cell is how we program our devices. This is through setting these nodes here, which are highlighted, and which can either be set, read, or polled. Now, let's see whether we can do a simple measurement and acquire a simple spectrum of our signal input. For this, we first configure the SHFQA internal oscillator and program it to 250 MHz above the center frequency of 3 GHz that we set above. Thus, the instrument will send out now a tone of 3.25 GHz. What we then do is we configure our scope and take a snapshot of the input. This will take some time, but now indeed we see a nice oscillation here or here in the zoom in. This now shows the Fourier transform of this data and we clearly see our data peak. And the only other peak that we see here is actually a DC spur, which is specific to the system and will be reduced in the final product. So with this, Let's go now to the resonator spectroscopy, where we will change the frequency of this tone over a certain frequency range and observe the change in amplitude and phase while we're probing the resonator. So for this demo, we will use again our Python API to fully control the instrument. We first, and already have done this, initialized our notebook and connected to the instrument. And now what we will do is actually a two-step process in the first measurement, we will measure the through um, in the loopback configuration of the instrument. This will allow us to calibrate or get a measurement of the cable transmission, which we can then use in the end to calibrate our cavity, which we will measure in the second step. So to do this spectroscopy measurement, what we will use is the sweeper module, which we instantiate here, and then we configure it to run uh, a sweep between 80 and 140 megahertz um, at an offset of, of 8 gigahertz. We know that the cavity lie is at 8.1 gigahertz, so this is right in the center of this frequency range. We'll measure in this case 100 points in a linear mapping, and for each point we dwell for about a millisecond here, and we only do one average for each point. Um, of course, we configure the channel output that we want to measure everything on, on the first channel, and then we uh, set, of course, also the, uh, the ranges for the output and the input of our up, super heterodyne up and down conversion. And all of these settings now get programmed or collected uh, into the sweeper module. The outputs get switched on, and then everything is written to the device. And now, after this is done, we are now ready to start our measurement. And uh, what we do is, as I said before, we first do a frequency sweep of the resonator. Uh, of the through. And for this, we just run our sweeper module and we wait until it's finished. And as soon as it's finished, what we will get is we will get the results automatically pre-configured and we can just write them into this, uh, into this variable here. Or into this. So now that this is done, uh, we plot here the transmission of our through uh, as a function of the frequency, again, at a difference of uh, 8 or at the center frequency of 8 gigahertz. So now that we have exchanged the, cav the through with the cavity, let's just run the sweeper module again. And the nice thing is we don't have to configure the sweeper module again because all the settings are stored. We just need to run it. And uh, the results will then get stored in this result 
name here. And uh, what we will also do again as above, we will use the sweeper module to actually generate us a, a first plot of the transmission of the resonator. And indeed, this is what we see here. We see a very nice resonance at 8.11 gigahertz, which we now have to pro divide with the through calibration to get a properly calibrated data out of this. And I think it is important to know here or to state here again that this measurement was really done now with just connecting two microwave cables from the in the output of the instrument to the cavity. Nothing else was set up. Everything else is really integrated into the instrument, uh, really probing this cavity at 8.1 gigahertz. So now to get the fully calibrated measurement, this is very simple. We just divide the two data formats or the data arrays through each other, and then we just plot the, the results. And indeed, we see again here our properly calibrated transmission of the cavity with an insertion loss of roughly 15 dB. And uh, we also look, can have a look at the phase, which again does a very nice phase change again at the position of uh, or at the resonance frequency of the cavity. Um, so with this, we have shown you now how to using only two microwave cables to do a measurement of a of a cavity and of course this calibration step this last one or the, the through measurement this doesn't ha necessarily have to be done for a readout but it's often nice to see uh, if you want to get a proper measurement of your transmission of your cryostat or feed line for example and with this i think we go back to the main part of the presentation so now that we have seen how we can measure a system that sits at eight gigahertz Let's have a closer look how we can do a more involved measurement. Let's simulate the measurements of 16 qubits in parallel. What does the instrument need to do for that? Let's first start with the signal generation side. The main requirements here are that we can generate a readout pulse that probes all 16 readout resonators at the same time. Each resonator has slightly different properties, and therefore the optimal shape to do a measurement on such a resonator looks slightly different for each. Therefore, we need arbitrary waveform generator capability. Ideally, the generation of the signal is not static, but can be dynamically changed throughout our quantum algorithm. For this, the AWG needs to be smart and be able to do real-time decisions. You also do not want to wait for a long time when uploading new waveforms or sequences. So a fast upload of the new experiments is important. These are just the minimal functionality that we think a readout system needs to provide off the cuff. But we added also a few more nice features. The flexibility, for example, to adjust readout parameters quickly, a fast resonator spectroscopy to do a swift characterization of your system during tune-up, and in general, we took a lot of care to make the system as user-friendly as possible when configuring. How do we achieve all that? First, we assign for each qubit its own waveform memory block where the individually optimized arbitrary waveform shapes can be uploaded. Each of these waveform memory blocks can be individually started and with its own delay. This in the end allows to make decisions in real time which qubits should be read out and when. That's the staggered readout. How is all of this controlled? Well, this is done using our well-proven sequencer. For example, we can start a readout of qubits 0 and 2 using only a single command that starts the readout, the weighted integration, and the playback of the waveform memory. Alternatively, we can use one of our newest features that you can find as well in our HD AWG, which is the HD AWG that control qubits. This is the command table. The command table allows you to go to the maximum of our instruction memory and also allows you to optimize the information that needs to be re-uploaded to the device. Hence, we can have the fastest upload by just transmitting the minimal information to the device. Finally, of course, we also have an internal oscillator over which we have the control over frequency, amplitude, and phase. And this can be used to do spectroscopy close to the physical speed limit. By the way, the signal from this oscillator was what we actually used before to do the spectroscopy of the cavity. So now we know how we generate our readout signals after they traveled through the feed line and changed their amplitude and phase according to the state of the resonator, readout resonator. The system needs to detect this change and then discriminate the corresponding qubit states. This is the task of the signal analysis after digitization and down conversion. 
What are the tasks here specifically? Most importantly, it needs to have all the means to optimize the signal to noise of the readout for single shot qubit readout. For feedback and error correction, all the analysis needs to happen at the shortest possible time or latency. And of course, all that in parallel for up to 16 qubits. We also added additional important features. Of course, it needs to be easily configurable, but with all the needed flexibility. We added multi-stage discrimination to it as a really new big feature to be able to not read out qubits only, but also higher level systems, for example, three level systems or qubits, or even quads. So why do we think this will be important going forward? Well, here are a few selected reasons. First, with the multi-state discrimination, one can better initialize the qubits. For example, in one of our application nodes, we could clearly see that temperature resulted in some excitation of a third level, which can be seen here by the population in this additional plot, where this one indicates the qubits being in the ground state, these are the excited state, and again, this in the, in the next higher level, the F level. Multi-state discrimination also speeds up the tuning uh, of gates, for example, by tuning the drag parameter, as we can directly detect whether the qubit ended up in the excited, uh, the ground or the F level. If you cannot do this properly and fast, this can be a significant fidelity loss, and especially when scaling up your qubit numbers, the tune-up time can really explode. Finally, there its multi-state discrimination also enables better algorithms, for example, for readout. Here, just let me cite one of the latest success stories by IBM that used the excited state promotion in their readout protocol to significantly improve on their assignment fidelity and reach higher quantum volumes. They also needed to reset their qubit states from all the levels, and they did it in sort of a cumbersome way since they didn't have multi-level state discrimination. So how does the readout signal processing actually works? Initially, a signal consisting of all the different readout frequencies and tones is entering the analysis chain indicated here from the left. The signal is then split into its components for each qubit readout by applying a matched filter. To determine these filters, the answer of each readout alternator and for each qubit state, in this case here for a three-level system, are first recorded. The difference then between these traces is then saved as a matched filter and does so in a, in a template. If we now correlate this matched filter template, which means we multiply and integrate it with the input signal, then this serves as a matched filter that only distills the, respond of the response of the respective resonator. We do this correlation in a fully complex way, such that one has the full freedom to define these filters and even use them to rotate the complex signal. What is the result? The result is that you obtain three blobs in a complex pane with minimal processing steps and hence minimal processing time. Every measurement of this qubit now will be part of one of these data clouds. So the only thing that the system needs to do now is to find out to which data cloud the state belongs to and voila, it assigned the state of the qubit. This can be done with discriminators that are defined by the users. And in the end, this will really enable real-time readout or active research of higher levels. So what is the missing part for this? The missing part is, in the end, that these states need to be communicated through the SHFQA's communication channels, the digital input-output port or the RSET sync. But more to this later. Again, all this together really enables fast feedback or error correction and do this even on a global system level. Again, this is something which you will see soon. So first, let's have a look at the simulated multi-qubit readout. For this, we first put the SHFQA in the loopback configuration, which means we connect the output of the system to the input. We will then simulate the signals of 16 qubits, which are roughly spaced by 20 MHz, being first always in the ground state, and then later in the sequence always in the excited state. The signal will be first now upconverted to microwave frequencies, and then input into our signal processing chain, mimicking a true multi-qubit readout. In the demo, we will see mainly two plots. In the first one, we will see the plops of each qubit in the complex pane. We can then set a threshold, and for some of the qubits, we will have a look at discriminated results. For this, we will make sure that the threshold is well set for some of these qubits, but for some of them, it's not. This will then show us the, the real-time character of the readout by indicating errors in our detection results. So now 
Let's start with the demo. In this demo again, we'll make use of our Python API that allows to control all aspects of the instrument. The notebook and the demo follow the same logic that the real experiment on qubits will follow, with a few slight tweaks of course to simulate the response of the qubits. First, we'll initiate the notebook, load all necessary libraries and then connect to the instrument. Then we start the simulated experiment. Here, first, we'll program the readout signal generators, in specific the 16 memory blocks that we discussed before, with frequencies that are roughly distributed over a range of plus minus 150 megahertz and around 4 gigahertz. We'll then program two different states for each qubit that then differ only in the phase of the signal. In the next step, we'll determine the integration weights that really then select the contribution of each qubit and we do this through a measurement and then upload them to the device. Finally, when all the readout is set up, we'll start our measurement and plot the results as well as discriminate the results in real time. So let's start by evaluating the first part of the notebook, which I will do by just evaluating all the, out, the, the cells above this one here. After initialization, similar to the previous demo, we first program the output and the input settings of the instrument and define the center frequency to be four gigahertz. Note specifically here, similar to the before, that we use nodes to communicate with our instruments that can be set, read, or polled. Then we define now the 16 different pulses of roughly two microseconds length and program them into the 16 different memory blocks. And we will do this in a, in a way that the, the phase increases for each qubit, which will then result in the different qubit states to be definitely separated uh, in the end uh, in the result. So now let's have a look whether this was successful by using our built-in uh, oscilloscope. And with this command here, we can first activate the signal generator outputs and then acquire a trace with this oscilloscope at the same time using 100 averages. And indeed, what we first see here is the two microsecond pulse, which consists of all 16 different frequencies. And again, note here that all of this is measured in the baseband, so within the one gigahertz bandwidth of the analysis band. Now, of course, the signal was up converted to the four gigahertz using our loopback configuration and then down converted again um, all of this, of course, with the double superheterodyne frequency conversion that we have built in. If you now look at the Fourier transform of the acquired signal, we indeed see, see that we have 16 different frequency tones that will change in the phase as the simulated qubit state will change. So now we need to determine the integration weights. In the real experiment, one will prepare the qubit in either the ground or the excited state and then measure the short response of the resonator and then do this over and over again and average the signal many times to get a good signal to noise ratio. What we don't have here is real qubits and real resonators. So what we do is just averaging the two different type of output pulses that simulate the two qubit states for each qubit and with a small output power of the instrument. So to do this, let me just evaluate these cells here and uh, we'll have a look at how such a, how such a signal will, will look like. So what you can see here is that the program now really iterates through the different qubits and also the different states, qubit zero here and state zero here, and then averages this and then goes on to the next qubit and again averages the signal as you would do it in a real experiment by switching to, between the different readout resonators. So now let's have a look at such an average trace for a single qubit. The orange trace down here now represents the amplitude of the ground state, the other one on the, uh, of the excited state. And as expected, we do not see a difference in the amplitude of these reference traces, as we defer and made sure that these two states only deferred in the phase of the signal, but not in the amplitude. So now to calculate the optimal weights, we take now the complex difference between these reference traces, which can be, the, which can be seen here, and uh, what is important to know also is that we, there's now a very easy way to rotate your signal in the complex plane. And this can be done by just defining here this rotation coefficient and just multiplying this to, the, to these weights or to the difference between these reference traces. And what is the good thing about this? This really comes from the complex multiplication or the 
complex signal processing, which we carry on through the full processing of the results. And this will save now a, an additional step that, uh, that the FPGA needs to, needs to be implemented, which is a, an additional rotation. Um, and this is, of course, only happening uh, if you do this in the same way as our first generation instruments by just multiplying uh, the, the signals in a, in a real way and not treating them as completely complex signals. So now what we do is we will just uh, evaluate these or calculate these weights and program or write them down to the device, which was done here. Now we are ready to start our measurement. So now that the instrument is programmed, let's take an actual measurement by first simulating all qubits being in the ground state and then in the excited state. So for this, let me quickly evaluate this following section. And uh, what you can see here now is that the instrument simulates a, a qubit readout where for the first 25 measurements, the qubit were in the ground state, and now for the next 25 measurement, the qubit is in the excited state. And it does this for all qubits, of course, uh, at the same time. And uh, what we can do now is we can actually have a look at the, at the results of this, and, and we look at the results of this measurement and the, and the, the integration in, uh, in the complex plane. And this is probably one of the more impressive plots of this of this uh, demo, because what you can see here now is really all 16 qubits that were acquired at the same time. And for each of the qubits, you see two blobs. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, for the brown one here, the blob for the ground state, and here the one for the excited state. And as we expected and programmed, these plots in increase from in signal strength from the qubit 0 to the qubit 15, which is, uh, which is sitting up here um, as, we, as we designed this. And in, the, in addition, what we also see is that the amplitude is the same, roughly for all the two states, but uh, it's, they change mainly in, in phase. So this is all expected. So, um, and this is one of the, the first steps which you would take in an actual measurement. And now what you would do is, uh, if you want to really run your, your algorithm, then you would like to actually discriminate these states now in real time in the experiment. And what you need to do for this is you need to set a threshold which then tells the instrument, okay, all the qubits which are below the threshold correspond, uh, the, they are in the state zero, and all for them, all the measurements which are above this threshold, there the qubits are in the excited state. And this is exactly what we do here for simplicity. We program now the threshold to be zero for all of them. And the good thing in the, by choosing this same threshold is that we can really discriminate nicely all these higher lying qubits or the qubits with the large numbers, for example, uh, qubit 15 here is very well separated and below and uh, above this threshold at zero. And this is different, of course, for these states with lower sig smaller signals. For example, the qubit zero is completely missed and the threshold actually goes through the blob uh, corresponding to the ground state of, the, of qubit one and two. And uh, so what the instrument now does is, uh, and while I was talking, actually did is it repeated the experiment, again, 50 samples or 50 measurements, where the first 25 were in the ground state, the next 25 were in the excited state, and it did this real-time state discrimination in the instrument, saved the data on the instrument, and now after it's finished, we actually downloaded it from the instrument and display it now on the computer. And this is exactly what we can do here now with this bokeh plot. And for this, let me quickly just zoom in to make it larger. Um, and this now really shows the, the, the discriminated states for each qubit that the instrument acquired in real time, and which you can use then to, to communicate also again in real time to different instruments of the QCCS to, for example, to do feedback or, or error correction. And if you now look at one of these qubits with these large numbers, then what we see is that all of these are very well discriminated and show exactly the state behavior 
that we that we intended to because in the first 25 measurements it was in the ground state in the later ones it was in the excited state however the situation gets much more interesting if you look at one of the qubits in the in, with a lower number for example qubit zero this was completely missed by our threshold and always assigned uh, every measurement to be in the in the excited state so this is a really badly set threshold and if you now look at for example qubit 2 or, or qubit 1 then we see these thresholds are still not well set because we still see these errors from time to time but they're better set and, and closer to this ideal value which uh, was indeed measured for these higher lying states and just to give you a bit more perspective or explanation of this plot so this is a result of our result logger which really takes and acquires all the data and then you can transfer them to the computer um, as you want and what you can also do is you can average on this result logger so here we just did a single shot so we just did 50 measurement at each time just a single measurement for each qubit but you could also just repeat this for example by doing a tv mode type averaging and in this case what you will get is uh, you will get actually the the results or the averaged results of your states. So for example, if you do a Rabi measurement, then you can actually see this Rabi measurement uh, here, or the results of this Rabi measurement here uh, through an oscillation in the signal. And with this, I would like to, to end the demo and uh, go back to the main part of this presentation. But before we do this, let's answer whether the performance of the readout that we've seen in the simulated experiment extends to real qubit measurements and also whether higher qubit states can be distinguished with this instrument. For this, let me share with you the first success story of the SHFQA in the field, where one of our new generation quantum analyzers measured qubits in the group of Andreas Walraff at ETH Zurich. For this, more than 30,000 measurements were performed and a single qubit was excited to its different states. The SHFQA in itself was configured to use two matched filters to optimally discriminate the G, E, or F level. The results of this first benchmarking measurement you can see here in this plot. Visually, we can clearly distinguish the three q states, but also mathematically these can be assigned with an average fidelity of 95% in this specific case. This number has to be put into perspective with measurements using the standard readout electronics. For example, using our first generation quantum analyzer, the UHFQA, and home built frequency conversion. This is a combination that has been tested many times worldwide up to now. The key conclusion here is that in both cases, the readout fidelity was the same and not limited by the quantum analyzer. This means that we can do high performance readout with this more powerful, yet much simpler to operate room temperature control electronics, the SHFQA. So finally, let's come to the final part of the event demonstrating the SHFQA in a full-blown quantum computing control system. And let's have a look at the feedback experiment. But first, let me give you a quick overview over our quantum computing control system architecture. If you want to know more information about the system, please just contact us or have a look at our QT-focused webinar that can be viewed through our YouTube channel. In short, there are three different types of instruments. There are arbitrary waveform generators to control the qubits, there's the quantum analyzers to read out their states, and there's the central controller that synchronizes all channels of all instruments to sub-nanoseconds. We rely on a star topology. Why is this the case? Well, one of the biggest reasons for this is that there's no penalty in performance when scaling up the number of instruments or the system size. Currently, we can interface more than 144 channels if 18 HDAWGs, our control instruments, are connected. The setsync link both distributes the clock and also the data which allows each instrument to communicate with each other. All this is controlled by a new Lab1 QCCS control software that really treats the system as one instrument that is more than the sum of its parts. In this picture, you see an assembled 28 instruments into the two racks. The main, the, they mainly consist of our first generation instruments. HDAWGs and UHFQAs and function as a testbed for our QCCS. So for this demo, we've added the SHFQA into the same system. A single SHFQA instrument 
replaces now four to six of the first generation quantum analyzers, the UHFKAs. So let's first start up all the 16 instruments and we also switch off the lights that you can see all the nice LEDs flickering. Then we connect to the instruments. What we will do now is that we run a simultaneous Ramsey sequence on 14 of the HDAWGs. All are controlled through the central controller, the PQSC. We connect the first outputs of eight of the AWGs and combine them with their third outputs into a 16 volt combiner. The last part of the combiner is then connected to the output part of the SHFQA, such that we can see the outputs of all the AWGs and the SHFQA on one oscilloscope trace. During the demo, which you can see now here in the fast forward, we will switch on the instruments one by one and every time a new instrument switches on, you see eight new lights appearing. But now let's have a look at the actual signals. For this, we switch on to the Lab1 graphical user interface and we see a sequence of the SHFQA's readout pulses. Since the scope is not being triggered, it's not acquiring data currently, of course. If we zoom into one of the readout pulses of the SHFQA and start the same experiment that you have seen before in a fast forward, we first add the output of one of the AWGs to our SHFQA traces. We clearly see the two pi over two pulses that increase in separation for every step of the sequence. As can be seen in the inset, these are programmed to an intermediate frequency of about 50 MHz and are stable in phase for every repetition of the experiment. Now that we add additional AWG pulses and AWG outputs, we see that all pulses add up coherently. This means the amplitude increases, but there's no destructive interference of the different channels. That is because all the instruments are synchronized properly. The reason why the readout pulse of the SHFQA is flickering, by the way, is because we send in a high frequency and because we do not reset the phase yet in this instrument. However, given that there's no shift in the timing with respect to the other pulses, we can trust that the readout can be done in a coherent and also well-synchronized fashion. At the end of the sequence, all instrument outputs will be turned off and then reinitialized re again. And now, we go back to the main part of the event and have a look at how we can do feedback in this system. Now that we have seen that the SHFQA is part of our QCCS, let's have a look at the arguably most important task of the combined system, feedback. So why do we want feedback? On the one hand, it can give you a better state preparation fidelity, for example, through active reset. This is now even possible to do on q trits or q quads using the SHFQA. Furthermore, Intelligent feedback on the global level through the PQSC enables global error correction by syndrome decoding or ancilla reset. Let's have a look at the most simplest feedback, active reset now. And just to remind you what is active reset. Active reset is a feedback mechanism that is getting more and more important as qubit lifetimes increase. Consider now a qubit even with just a moderate lifetime of roughly 10 microseconds. After an algorithm, you need to wait for tens of microseconds until the qubit is mostly decayed. And even then, thermal population can still introduce an error. What you can do now is directly after your experiment, you run a single shot readout that determines the state of the qubit. The result is then communicated to an HDAWG, the control system, that plays a control pulse if, it is, if the qubit is in the excited state or no if the qubit is in the ground state already. That way, you can reduce the dead time of the qubit to a few hundred nanoseconds or maybe a microsecond and get a much better initialized qubit in addition. So just for demonstration purposes, let's now assume that we want to do a reset experiment on a global level. This means through the PQSC. First, what we will do is we perform a simulated qubit readout similar to before in the loopback configuration of the SHFQA. Here, we just do it on a single qubit instead of 16, just for simplicity, and the state of the qubit will be alternating between the ground and the excited state. Then we communicate the results to the PQSC via our set sync. The PQSC then forwards this result to one of the HDAWGs in the system. The HDAWG will then see in which configuration the qubit has been, and if the qubit has been in the ground state, it will play a pulse at full amplitude, which is a negative sign. If the qubit was in the excited state, 
it will play a pulse with a positive sign, again on the, with a full amplitude. So what we expect is a series of pulses with alternating sign, starting from a sign with a negative, where the qubit was in the current state, switching to a positive pulse, where the qubit is in the excited state, and so on and so forth. So let's do the test. So for this demonstration, we use the same big system and setup on which we have shown the Ramsey experiment in the last demo. On the screen, you can see the lab 1 interface on the left, where we show the oscilloscope module that observes the readout pulse of the SHFQA and the HDAWGs. On the right, you see our Python API that is used to program the system such that the SHFQA simulates a single qubit readout, forwards the results via our central controller to one of the AWGs, which will then play a pulse accordingly. Let's have a closer look at how we program the SHFQA. As mentioned before, we'll alternate the simulated qubit state between the crowd and the excited state. For this, we'll use the sequencer program that you can see in the highlighted section in our Python script. Early in this event, we have introduced the start QA command, which first selects which of one of the waveform memories is played, and then which qubit is read out. This you can see now here in action. In an infinite while loop, we first activate waveform memory 0, that's where the simulated ground state of the qubit is stored, and read out qubit 0, and then forward the results to the PQC at address 0. Then we activate waveform memory 1, that's where the excited state is stored, and again read out qubit 0 and forward the results. So first, let's see how our complex plane looks like. This is now the same measurement as we have seen in one of the last demos, only with one qubit in this time. And indeed, we see two measurement results corresponding to state 0 and 1. Note that here we increase the power of the readout such that we can observe the readout pulse in the scope trace. Now what we do is we set a threshold at 0 which distinguishes these two states. Then we rerun the experiment and observe the outcome on both the result logger of the SHFQA but also on the oscilloscope end. Indeed, we see something appear. On the SHFQA, we observe an alternating state of the qubit 0 as expected. But also the feedback worked, since we see the readout pulse of the SHFQA and then in the same trace the HDAWG playing first the pulse with positive amplitude and then later with negative amplitude, similar to the simulated qubit. Please note now the following two things. The feedback could not only be done between a single SHFQA and a single arbitrary waveform generator, but could be done between the SHFQA and an arbitrary number of the 14 AWGs that we have currently installed in the system. Also, the feedback time of about 8 to 900 nanoseconds between the last sample of the readout pulse and the signal of the AWG is continuously being worked on and shortened. And with this, let's finish this demonstration and the main part of the event, and let's go back to Paolo. All right, welcome to the live Q&A session. Thank you for watching till the end of, the, uh, of this uh, webinar. And for all your questions, please keep writing them in the Q&A box down below. And we will try to answer as many questions as possible in the next 15, maybe 20 minutes. All right, let's start. I have here a question. You sample at four giga samples per second, a signal at three gigahertz. What about Nyquist criteria and aliasing? Tobias, would you like to take this one? Yes, so um, uh, yes, it is true that we are working in this case at the second Nyquist zone, but uh, there's no drop in performance, of course, uh, in the digitization of the signal. And it actually gives you the benefit that, uh, that uh, it flips the order of the signal. Um, so the, your sidebands are actually flipped and then this helps you then uh, to be consistent also with the signal generation. So it actually helps the user. All right, thank you. Second question. Are you also participating in government funded research projects? Sadik? With pleasure. Uh, great question. And uh, I'll permit myself to give the not so short answer. So government funded projects, yes, we do them, but they're not our business model. And as a matter of fact, the SHFQA is a great example for 
how we do innovation in government funded projects. So in the American uh, IHAPA funded QSURF project, actually the first, the, the, the project for the SHFQA was born. And there we have uh, developed the concept and the design for the SHFQA. And in that project, it was all about building a logical qubit, error corrected qubit. So everything that you see in the SFQA, we, we always had in mind to do error correction. That was one of the big themes. So government projects, yes, we do them. They're not part of the business model, but they're really at the heart of our way of doing innovation. Thank you. Next question. Well, will the SHFQA be available? Okay, I'll uh, maybe take this one. Uh, we share the load. The SHFQA will be, uh, we will start shipping it uh, in the first quarter of 2021. So effectively just a few months away. All right, next question. Can I read out my neutral atoms, neutral atoms with the SHFQA? Uh, Tobias? Well, um, it's not designed for this. So, uh, so as you mentioned, that uh, the main target area is uh, superconducting circuits and and uh, spin qubits. But um, of course, you're always happy uh, to evaluate whether there's uh, alternate options that you didn't consider. So, uh, but no, uh, short answer. Uh, in principle, it's not intended to do that. Okay, next one. Can you explain a bit more what the Z-Sync is? Uh, Sadik? Question again. Um, so the Z-Sync is our own proprietary uh, link between the instruments and the central controller. And now you might think, oh no, why again another proprietary standard? Uh, While well, there are other standards around that do that, for example, PXI. And now Z-Sync does two things. For one thing, it synchronizes the instruments. It initializes, starts, triggers them, which is something that PXI and other things can also do. However, there is one very specific requirement for quantum error correction, and that is very low latency and also a very um, consistent latency. And you want to have a central point of global knowledge so that you are as free as possible to do your syndrome decoding. And because latency is such a really important thing, uh, it's, it's such a valuable thing, there is not much space for any protocol. So when you look at it, Zsync is really a quite simple protocol in the sense that it is serial but not much more. So it allows for a big fan out due to the serial nature, but it is also very fast. And it's, it's all about providing the architecture to do quantum error correction. All right, next question. This is a long one uh, for you, Tobias. Could you explain how are you generating a quantum signal polarized photons, electron spins, or, or is this system just for controlling a generated quantum signal? Yeah, so uh, this system is uh, exactly uh, what you uh, answered in your second part of your question. So it is actually just for readout um, quantum or signals which, which come actually from a quantum computer. So we do not generate, uh, there's nothing quantum about this instrument itself. Um, but of course, it's uh, it really, is operating directly on the quantum system in the end. Good. Uh, so again, I would like to invite you, if you have any questions, please uh, keep asking them in the uh, Q&A box. Uh, at the very bottom, you can find the, the, uh, the button to, to open it. Uh, we have still time, so we'll, uh, we'll try to go through them all. Now, quick question. Uh, can I also buy an instrument with only one channel? And again, I'll take this one and uh, the short answer is uh, no, we have a two channel version and we have a four channel version. Okay, now Sadik, you are called by name here. Sadik, on your chart with the qubit numbers, 
Can you comment on the 100 qubit system data point at the end of next year? Wonderful question. Thank you. Um, so 100 qubits, we want to make sure that we are not the limiting that we never become the limiting factor in research. And our leading customers, they target 100 qubits uh, on that time scale. So we make sure that we will have an appropriate system by that time. And when we talk about 100 qubits, the solution that we have in mind to have at that time uh, will fit into two racks and uh, will otherwise look very much like what you have seen today. So actually this 100 qubits, that timeline is determined by our most progressive customers. All right. So what if I want to optimally read out q -treats? How many signal generation memories do I need? Uh, Tobias? Mm -hmm. So uh, that's a very nice question. Um, in principle, uh, if you have uh, Qtrits, then of course you have uh, sort of three different positions of your resonator. And to optimally distinguish them, ideally uh, you drive them with, with two tones, which are uh, where each of the tones essentially maximizes the signal, which distinguishes two of these resonator states. Uh, so, idea, and so ideally you would like to drive it with two tones. Um, and that's something of course, which is very nicely uh, possible uh, to do with our 16. Um, with, with our 16 wafer memory blocks because you can really just assign two of them uh, or, or two, two memory blocks to, to drive or, or read out one qubit. Or you can, even if you want to, you can combine the two signals since it's really a truly arbitrary waveform memory. You could also combine the two signals into one memory block uh, if you want to, for example, use it for, for other, uh, use other signals which you, which you want to do, for example, for um, resonator depopulation pulses or something. Good. Sadik, very interesting question now. When will you have a system that can control a thousand qubits? I saw that question. I love it. <laughs> um, good question. Um, so I can tell you what we know. Uh, we know that now with our second generation system, we will satisfy 100 qubits and the next step will go to 200 qubits. This is kind of on our horizon. Now the 1000 qubits, uh, that touches a very challenging point for a company in quantum computing. Uh, if we had a system for 1000 qubits today, we wouldn't sell it because uh, we would be too early. So when will we have it? I hope we'll have it in time. We'll definitely strive to do so, but I cannot make any sense it will take a while for a quantum processor with a thousand qubits to exist. And before that happens, uh, there's no point for us in, in going there. And, and that's what makes our, uh, our times really exciting. And this dynamic, very dynamic question of when is it too early and when is the right time to commercialize the technology uh, is, uh, is a very challenging and exciting question actually. It's what keeps us uh, excited and busy. Indeed. Uh, Tobias, how do you manage to make multiple quantum measurements and not destroy qubits? Okay, so uh, when it comes to uh, superconducting circuits and spin qubits, I hope you don't destroy your qubits, but I, I guess what you're meaning is, the, is actually the qubit state. Um, and in the end, this is uh, something which uh, is not directly taken over by, by our instrument, but the idea is that um, essentially you have your qubit and then you have your resonator, which, are, resonator, which is very far detuned. And um, the qubit is then dispersively coupled to the resonator, which means depending on the qubit state, uh, the, the resonator shifts, but there's essentially no direct um, uh, destructiveness necessarily um, coming from the from the resonator onto the qubit state. Uh, that's why it's because you're so far detuned. So there's, uh, so this is essentially a key part of this uh, dispersive readout. I hope this answers the question. 
Now, Sadik, I think this is probably one of the uh, more interesting questions and probably one that uh, will bring you off uh, your comfort zone. Do you have any advice for a high school student who wants to pursue a career in quantum computing? Well, first of all, congratulations about uh, considering it. I think it's, uh, it's very wise. And uh, if, you, if you're looking into an, uh, a demanding and challenging environment with lots of potential, I think, I think we're not even aware of the full potential that quantum computing will bring in the decades to come. So my, my, my first feedback would be, uh, great that you have it actually that as a high school student you're looking into this I, I think this is awesome and we need uh, the industry and the science will need tons of talented people to figure out the the, the full potential of quantum computing um, go to university study study physics find a place where quantum is taken serious and uh, be sure to find the right mentors be selective in finding and choosing your place. And the time is really good for you because everybody is looking for people that want to get busy. Very good advice. Okay, probably a bit technical, but can you elaborate on how you control a quantum signal without collapsing it or measuring it, uh, Tobias? Okay, um, so uh, we, I, I don't think that we can actually control. Uh, so and I'm not sure whether with control you mean really the, the feedback control in this case, but of course you cannot uh, actually act on a qubit if you if you have no means of, of directly measuring it. Um, so uh, the key um, readout technique here is actually a collapse of the waveform function um, potentially, or if you just do it in this in this dispersive case, you're you uh, you still project onto uh, you still project onto a specific um, onto a specific state. So you do uh, in this case uh, collapse your waveform function. Um. All right, Sadik, what other instruments can we expect in your, in your second generation control system? Okay, now that's of course a touchy one. Uh, anyhow, thank you for for the question. And of course, uh, we're very busy. We have a team of uh, uh, R&D team of, uh, I believe, more than around 50 people working on new products. So yes, you can expect new technology coming out of our development pipeline. Um, one of the first steps, one of the steps we're currently working on is to get rid of all IQ mixers in a control system. Um, I will leave the rest to your imagination. <laughs> um, this is one of the very next generation two products. Okay, so I think that we're coming to uh, the end. So let's take one last question for Tobias. Compared to the UHF QA, how much is the difference in phase noise or general noise contribution to qubit control? Mm -hmm. So uh, in terms of signal, it's a bit hard to compare them because uh, you have to imagine that on the UHF QA, uh, what you do is you still have to provide typically your own up conversion uh, electronics. And, and typically what is limiting the phase noise is our, could be our synthesizers ideally. So not the basement signals. Um, and this is also, essentially the case for the SHFQA that, uh, that it's more this, this up conversion process, which is limiting the phase noise. Um, however, we can say that, uh, that our phase no that we put a great deal uh, into designing exactly this, this up conversion scheme and our synthesizers um, such that uh, phase noise uh, is in generally not the limit, should not be the limiting case if you read out your qubits. Um, okay, but, uh, of course, Sorry, go ahead. But but uh, uh, I'm uh, I'm very happy to uh, if you contact us. I, I'm very happy uh, that we that that we dig out exactly these numbers. 
All right. Thanks, Tobias. Thank you, Sadik. And uh, thanks to all of you for, for watching. We have unfortunately reached the end of our uh, time. But don't worry, all the questions that uh, you asked, we will collect them and answer them in a blog post. And we will email you the link to this blog post uh, in, uh, in the coming days and uh, maybe a week. So we would like to thank you all for attending the event and for the uh, uh, interest that you expressed in the SHF QA quantum analyzer. Please, as uh, Tobias said, contact us. If you have any questions, uh, we would like to discuss with you uh, your application and your needs. And of course, if you want to have a more personalized uh, demonstration of the SHFQA, just get in touch. Thank you very much again. Goodbye.